more the immunocompromised state, more is the predisposition for different types of infections. Okay. And how does that depend on how will you find out how immunocompromised somebody is? By looking at the CD4 count. That will tell you the viremia load. Otherwise, you are a career for HIV. It's not that it troubles you the entire life. Say you were only 20 years when you became a career, but you can still have a lifespan of 45, 50, 55 years. And in that span, whenever you've had low immunity, you'll have flare up of infections. So you need to be smart that way to immediately pick up infection and usko tab ka tab settle kar do. Toh fir aage ki life sori comfortable ho jati. Got it? Yes, Vanch, did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am. Bolo. Uh, ma'am, I have a question that uh, related to COVID. Hmm. Ma'am, after after recovery of COVID, uh, I still doesn't uh, regain the sense of smell. Not still. How many? Uh, when when uh, did it test positive? Still means partially. Only partially I can smell everything. But when did you test positive? Ma'am, at May. May. So, May, June. July, two months ago. Okay. Uh, wait for some time. There's nothing more you can do. It will come with time. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Hmm. You were admitted or something, injections, or was it home quarantine only? No, ma'am, only home quarantine. Okay. Then it's all right. It's It's... If it is not that severe, then nothing too much to worry. Just a matter of time. In fact, after COVID, uh, the generalized weakness and few things, they take a lot of time to come back. I still have a few family members who feel very weak. It's been almost seven, eight months before they had COVID. It takes time. It is, in fact, not a very good disease to have. And we are actually living in very bad times these days. And if, yes, if we can see the third wave coming, it's going to be bad. Already China is reporting lots of cases of Delta virus. So how long will they keep it contained to their country is a big question mark. It will definitely become widespread again. Um, do I have to consult a doctor again? or No, no, no. Nothing. It's with time it will come. Nobody will be able to give you anything for that. Okay. 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 We still have only 19 people. shall we do? See, the good thing about our ships is we have a good number of almost 83 different types of medicines. Okay. So they work very well. All kinds of problems are taken care of. All infections are taken care of. Whether it is loose motions, whether it is malaria, whether it is fever. So whatever you will need in a regular normal lifestyle, 83 different types of medicines are there. Then there are a list of 20, 25 things which are different types of appliances that you might need. Yes, you know, things like uh, a BP apparatus, a bedpan urinal, okay, a thermometer, a Neil Robertson stretcher. So like this, almost a list of 25 things are there. Plus <coughs> the main books. The WHO manual, the I, ILO manual, where a detailed explanation as to any emergency and how to go about managing it is given. So each ship is equipped with all this material, plus everybody, the cook, the deck staff, everybody on the ship undergoes the EFA training. So 
knowledge is there the training is there everybody is aware of what has to be done even the sick room of the ship everybody should go visit time to time and see what is where and then of course your best friend is the on shore doctor so immediately there is a crisis convey the correct picture to him what all has happened how it has happened convey everything to the on shore doctor he will give you sound medical advice he is a proper medical officer with many many years of giving advice like this and he is the one who will direct the company to arrange for a evacuation okay so always a good idea to befriend him tell him the complete situation do not exaggerate do not under exaggerate whatever is the correct picture convey to him such that things happen in a proper fashion for your friend and there's a best recovery which can happen okay now uh, what shall i do for all these five people who are missing it's it's high time what is the time now 3:13 ho gaye hai okay do we need to take any action against them what do you say friends or somebody we not picking up how many tnoc are there how many gme are missing Let me see the list. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven GME boys are there. Originally, how many were supposed to be there? Ten. Ten. So three are missing, and they are supposed to be fourteen DNS. So how many are there? Nine. Five. Ma'am, four DNOC. Five. Five, five. See, there are nine present. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A child will be. Ha, ten. Ma'am, sixty-six is not there. Yeah. Ten are there. I didn't see. Hello. Okay. Ten TNOC is there and seven. Okay. Let them join. Fine. Their priority now. You are too senior. Ki, I'll go around catching you all. <coughs> There's one bit of the STCW video which is left. Let me just show you that. They have gone on to describe a condition called uh, diabetes over there. If you remember, diabetes, the concept is inko mita nahi dena hai, right? Control karna hai mita ka. Now this is an opposite situation. This is somebody who has been traveling on the ship for quite some time. he was given a particular dose uh by the on shore doctor but what happened is he continued this for 15 20 days and his body got accommodated and now his demand for insulin is much less but he is taking a much higher dose can you understand the line that i told you his demand for insulin is much less and he is taking a much higher dose so as a result what will happen the sugar values will become very low so he has gone into a state of hypoglycemia in that time you must either give him a packet of biscuits some rasgulla or gulab jamun or uh, chocolate cake whatever you have because you need to lift up his sugar val value and then and only then does he become normal okay that's the video which is there about diabetes okay can you see in here yeah this is about the diabetes that i just told you about apart from accidents 
you could have to deal with many other surprise situations with the potential for serious harm or even death. For example, diabetes is a common condition and a sufferer could require your help. When a diabetic's blood sugar falls below normal, the whole body is quickly affected. The condition is called hypoglycemia. The early signs include weakness, faintness and hunger. There might also be palpitations and muscle tremors. Strange behavior is another indication. As the condition worsens, the level of response gets worse. A person with hypoglycemia may become incoherent and possibly aggressive. The breathing becomes increasingly shallow. Look at the casualty's skin. It may be pale, cold and clammy. The pulse will be strong and bounding. But you don't need to check every one of these signs. Most diabetics in the early stages of hypoglycemia will be able to tell you what's the matter. Many sufferers carry some evidence that they're a diabetic, such as insulin, a syringe, a chain or a bracelet. If they show the signs but don't know that they're diabetic, you must get medical help. The treatment is simple. Sugar. Preferably a sugary drink. But you must act quickly before the patient becomes unconscious. You can give sugar on its own or in the form of sweets, sugary biscuits or cake. The casualty starts to improve within minutes. If they don't, or if they become unconscious, you must radio for medical help immediately. Now this is about epilepsy. If you are a known epileptic, then they don't allow you to recruit into Merchant Navy. But down the line, after a few years of sailing, if something like this developed, then obviously they can't ask you to take an alternative career. And what should you do in such a situation? This, this strip of video is about that. Dealing with an epileptic fit is another situation you might come across. This is another condition that looks worse than it actually is. While the fit is happening, move any furniture and sharp edges on which they could hurt themselves. In nearly all cases, don't move the casualty, but when you have to, you should use the correct techniques. The casualty may become rigid, arch their back, seem to lose all awareness of their surroundings and go into a state of muscular spasm. Do not interfere, but do loosen the clothing around the casualty's neck, if this is possible, or put something under their head. Do not try to restrain them, put anything in their mouth or move them unless they're in danger. You should make a note of the time and duration of the attack. When the convulsions have finished, the casualty usually relaxes into a deep sleep. Stay with them, placing them in the recovery position until they've fully recovered. When, as here, the person knows they have epilepsy, they will be the best judge of whether they need medical attention. But if a casualty doesn't know, or it's the first attack, they should see a doctor. Once in port, don't let them go off on their own anywhere until you're quite satisfied they are fully recovered. Allergic reactions can be very bad. They are known as anaphylactic reactions and sometimes it can be life-threatening also because first of all they come very soon and immediately it can spread to the entire body. Also whatever you are allergic to, say maybe the sulfonide, sulfonamide group of antibiotics or most of the antibiotics for that matter, then uh, cheese, coffee, fish. You must keep yourself away from all this because it can create a lot of trouble. Okay. You may have to assist a casualty that has developed an allergic reaction. Substances that are harmless to most people can have a strong effect on certain individuals. 
food allergies, insect bites and stings, or other substances entering the body by inhalation, swallowing, skin absorption or injection, may cause an anaphylactic shock. Here, and then I'll go get some help, okay? okay? Unless the casualty has their own treatment, medication for allergic reactions should only be used after obtaining radio medical advice. One such allergic reaction with alarming symptoms is asthma. The most obvious signs of asthma are that the sufferer takes a long time to breathe out and may make wheezing noises. In some cases, the casualty will be seriously distressed and have difficulty in speaking. They may even start turning blue and suffer exhaustion from the sheer effort of breathing. But in nearly all cases, the sufferer will have an inhaler. Ask them where it is and get them to use it. If they don't have one, or if it's a first attack, get radio medical advice. Chemical spills to any part of the body, but especially the eyes, need swift action combined with a cool head. The eye is a very sensitive area to deal with and care should be taken not to aggravate the situation further by bad handling. Remember to check first for dangers to yourself and your casualty. Your first priority is to flood the eye with running water as quickly as possible. Use water bottles which should be located around most chemical handling areas or the nearest wash area. Go to the nearest source at once. Bathe the eye for at least 10 minutes. If it's more convenient, use a glass of seawater. Take care that contaminated rinsing water does not flow from the affected eye to the good one or onto your skin. Meanwhile, the spillage must be cleared and the area made safe. Use the right protective gear and make sure that you're not the next victim. Even when you've brought the victim safely below, you must continue to flood the eyes with water for 10 minutes at a stretch several times. Just once isn't enough. It will also help to ease the pain. Reassure them. Eye injuries are especially frightening because the victim can think that they will be left blind. In between washing the eyes, test their vision. When you get radio medical help, the doctor will want to know how badly their eyesight has been affected. Simple tests like this one are fine. Then continue with the water treatment. One of our engineers has splashed his left eye with 10% caustic soda at 1100 hours GMT. Do not attempt any further treatment before taking advice from the doctor. In most cases, the doctor will tell you to cover the eye with a sterile eye patch. Don't use anything made from fluffy fabric because strands of the fibers will irritate the eye. Also, add a pad to the good eye. This will prevent movement of the eye and further damage. Stay in regular contact with the doctor who will instruct you depending on how the victim progresses. The other common eye condition you may have to deal with is arc eye, when an unshielded victim is exposed to a sudden burst of light from a welding arc. This may develop during the next few hours and is frightening because the victim may temporarily lose their sight completely. There may be pain for a period of about 12 hours, so the most important thing is to reassure them. It isn't necessary to flood the eye as you would for a chemical splash, but you do need to test the victim's vision and report your findings to the shore-based doctor. You may be told to fit a sterile eye patch. The doctor will also want you to retest the casualty's site after 24 hours. Otherwise, the treatment is rest. In most cases, normal vision returns a few hours after the incident.
poisoning accidents can take many forms. Among the most common are incidents where an industrial liquid is swallowed by mistake. What can complicate these accidents is not knowing what the victim has swallowed. So one of your first priorities must be to identify the substance and keep it. <coughs> With an unconscious patient, you would monitor ABC and be ready to resuscitate. If they're conscious, help them to rinse their mouth out thoroughly. This will at least flush away any toxic residue still present. In all cases, radio for medical advice immediately. If they vomit, keep a sample. It may eventually help to identify the poison. Head injuries are dealt with in detail in the booklet that accompanies the video. If there is an open wound, do not press down on it because there's always the possibility of brain damage. Don't poke around in the wound or attempt to remove bone fragments. Apply ABC, get the patient below and seek radio medical advice immediately. Hypothermia is the leading cause of death among shipwreck survivors. If the body has plunged into cold water for a period of time, the body's heat production will automatically increase in an effort to balance the heat lost. But if heat is lost faster than it's produced, the body temperature will fall and hypothermia will result. The casualty will be pale in color and exhibit frequent muscular rigidity, shivering and varying levels of consciousness and shock. Treatment for hypothermia will depend on the condition of the survivor. Those who are rational, capable of recounting their experiences and are still shivering, can be rewarmed in a warm bath at around 40 degrees C. Keep them with arms and legs submerged or in a shower sitting backwards with knees up. Remember that even conscious survivors can collapse and become unconscious shortly after rescue and never give the casualty alcohol. In more serious cases, where the survivor is not shivering and is semi-conscious or unconscious, you should immediately apply first aid measures. On rescue, check the casualty's breathing. If the casualty isn't breathing, start artificial respiration immediately. If the casualty is breathing but unconscious, lay them in the recovery position. This is necessary to ensure that their breathing is not obstructed. At this stage, avoid all unnecessary manhandling, even removing their wet clothes. Wrap the casualty in blankets, preferably keeping them horizontal with their head slightly down. That's manhandling, transport of a casualty. The final part of this video is about moving casualties on board ship. As a general rule, you only do this at sea. In port, it is better to wait for the ambulance to arrive. Only move the casualty in a life-threatening situation. The three-handed seat is easier both for the helpers and the casualty, but the casualty must be conscious and able to cooperate. The two helpers join their wrists in a T-junction. The casualty then uses this as a seat. The helper with the spare hand can then use it to steady the casualty's back. Alternatively, he can support a broken limb with it. For the casualty, this is a comfortable and reassuring way of being carried. For going up and down stairs, use the fore and aft lift even more comfortable is the four-handed seat. 
The two helpers join both wrists together, forming a kind of bench, but it means there is no spare arm left to steady the casualty's body. In a very confined space, use the drag-carry method. The casualty lies on their back and puts their arms around your neck. Tie their hands together if they're unconscious. Then crawl along using your neck and knees to drag the casualty with you. It's much easier if there are two of you. The helper at the back carries the casualty's legs so that he's kept off the floor. In some situations, the only way to get a casualty away from the place of the accident is to lift them vertically. For this, the best method is the Neil Robertson stretcher. If the victim is unconscious, they will require oxygen, suction and cervical spine immobilization. Tie their ankles and knees with a bandage. The third helper places the casualty's wrists around the second helper's neck. Then, one helper stands astride the victim's legs with their right hand under the left calf and the left under the right thigh. The helper at the head is the one in charge. The second helper stands astride the chest and clasps their hands underneath the victim. The stretcher should be ready close to the casualty's head with all straps unfastened. If you suspect spinal injury, you must ensure that the spine is kept straight and that the neck is supported, not allowing it to twist. The stretcher can now be strapped up and the casualty removed. If the victim is to be carried, you must have four bearers. If they're to be winched out, take care to keep their bodies straight as you attach the stretcher to the winch. There should also be a rope from the bottom of the stretcher which allows you to steady the stretcher as it goes up. Armed with the techniques you've learned in this series, you are in a position to make a real contribution to your shipmate's well-being. Okay. So that's clear. Here in the demo videos, there is one video I have about the splint. Whatever uh, we have in our uh, Great Eastern lab, everything these students have used, all the splints. This is for fractures, where there are different types of splints we can be used. What he's showing us is an arm splint. See how he's supporting the arm. Taking it around it and putting onto the Velcro. Then he'll further support it now by putting a triangular bandage. What he's showing us is a vertical triangular bandage. You can also add on and put a horizontal triangular bandage. Take it around the hand, put it onto the opposite shoulder and tie around there, around the neck. There is the other splint which he has for the wrist. See how he is using it. It's got a place for the thumb. The casualty wears it on the thumb. And it is taken all around to 
support the wrist joint. These are for fracture of the carpal bones. We also have one for the leg which heals to us now. There's another video where they are making a ring pad. That's again to control bleeding in the. He's going to make a head bandage for uh, a circumferential coverage of bleeding. So he's got a long gauze. He's made circles out of it, and he's reinforcing the bleeding with that gauze. And he's reinforcing it by taking turns around it. Just see how he's doing it. Okay, he keep on doing this till the entire bandage is done. He can make it into any size. If there was a bigger area of bleed, he could have made it into a bigger size. And since here there is a smaller area, so he is making a small. This is something which women in the village use to carry earthen vessels. They use it on their head and put the earthen pot on it. It is almost getting made. Very good. Very neatly made. This is mostly used for the head because there is a lot of collateral blood supply from everywhere. So to control on the bleeding now when he place it on the head, it will give a circumferential stoppage. It is applying pressure all over and controlling the bleeding. Works very well. Okay. I'll just give you a break now and we'll join back in 15 minutes. Okay? Yes, ma'am.